Hey, good morning. Welcome to Vineyard Columbus. So glad that you're here in the room. If you're online, welcome. Glad that you're with us. Uh, if you're in the room and you're able, why don't we stand together? We're going to get started with a time of worship like we do each week. So we're going to sing some songs to the Lord, lift up praise to Him today. And I would just encourage you, whatever you're coming in here with today, God knows exactly what you need. And so let's turn our attention to Him, our affection to Him, and let's worship the Lord today. Amen? We come to praise you. We come to praise you for all that you are, all that you've done. We come to praise you. We come to praise you. We come to praise you for all that you are and all that you've done. We come to praise.
we want to see you face to face. Lord, let your glory shine on us. If you would just give us a glimpse of your goodness, that would be That would be enough. We bring ourselves to you today. We want to see you. I confess my sin to you again. I confess I've drifted far. You draw me back into your loving arms and never let me go. Father, you're all I need. You're all I need. Father, you're Yes, you do. So sweet. 
This is who you are. You always find me. You're always with us. Always with us. You're our comfort. Never leave us. In times of trouble. Just take a moment. Let's I want us to sing just that simple bridge, just once or twice more. Just declaring together as a church some simple but powerful truths about God that He is beautiful, that He is faithful, He never leaves us, He never gives up on us, that He is beyond our comprehension that he's merciful time and time again. We can turn to him and he gives us mercy and grace. So if you're comfortable, I'd like to invite you just to lift your hands as we sing this again, as a way of using your whole body to say, God, you are beautiful, you are wonderful, you are amazing, you are faithful, you are a comforter, you are merciful to us, God. God, we remind ourselves this morning of who you actually are, not who we've made you to be, but your true character, your faithfulness to us, even when we can't see you, your kindness to us, even when we feel like we don't deserve it. We thank you, God, and we remember who you are, and we worship you today, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I do want to underline what Pastor Paul said at the opening of this worship set that even if you're coming in here, you don't even really know what you need. God is good and loves you and wants to give you what you need. So as we continue to worship today, I just invite you to open yourself up and say, God, will you help me know what I need and will you give that to me today? We're gonna continue in this posture of worship as we transition into the giving of our tithes and our offerings, which is a, something that we make space for each and every week because we wanna, we wanna worship God with all that we have. And a fun thing is that some, a lot of you know is we had summer camp a few weeks ago for our high schoolers and our middle schoolers. And I wanna give you a little window into what that week was like, so take a look with me. coming, promise.
good memories. I was there the, pretty much the whole week. And one thing that is really amazing that I get to tell you about is that while that is a window into just how fun summer camp was, there was a lot that went on that was really beautiful, deep, meaningful work of God's presence. We had, I had so many students tell me personally that they were experiencing God's spirit, some of them for the very first time. I had a girl whisper to me, I feel God. And I got to pray for her in that moment. And we had over 45 middle and high schoolers respond to the gospel and give their lives to Jesus. And then right after camp, we invited those same students to come and get trained for Alpha. We had 50 students get trained for Alpha so that they can give away their faith to their friends this fall. How exciting is that? And I tell you all this to remind you that what you're giving to is impacting real life people people that you might not have direct uh, connection with, but that are young people that are getting to know the good news of Jesus and be formed by his presence from, from a young age. How good is that? So thank you so much for your, your continued faithful generosity. And I also just wanna say from our team, thank you to those of you that gave above and beyond your ties to our special scholarship fund to send a bunch of students to camp. We're so grateful for you. We're gonna take a moment to uh, pray for our, this week's offering, but I do, uh, oh, there's a couple of ways you can give. We'll pass offering bags here in a second. You can uh, virtually give if you text the word give to 98977. It will send you a link that will take you right to the giving page. However you give, why don't we turn our hearts and just, again, give gratitude to the Lord for all he has given us. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you are always at work. You're always near, always working, even when we're totally unaware of it, God. So we, we bless the work that you did at summer camp. We pray more, Holy Spirit, would you have your way. We pray we would see dozens and dozens and dozens more of young people come to know you, Jesus. We say all we have is yours. Would you use our offering for your glory? Amen. Amen. Well, my name's Ellie. I am a pastor here with our, working with our young people, a joy and honor of my life. And I want to take a moment, if this is your first time walking in here, welcome. Or maybe you're the first time you've ever tuned in online. We're so glad to have you. And I want to make a really easy little uh, on-ramp for you once you're ready to take a step of connection around here. Some of you, you're like, from the first time you're in here, like, Put me in, coach. Others of you need a few weeks, and that's okay. Either way is okay, but a simple way to get connected is to text the word hi to 98977. That's gonna send you a virtual connect card and you'll just get to tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll be able to uh, connect you to a real life person to help you along your way. Uh, but I do, I am so grateful that you're here and we are, we want to, if you're here in person, we want to actually just get to meet you. So me and some other people, we're going to be standing at what we call Guest Central right after service. Just stop by and say hello to us. Uh, and again, we're glad that you're here. Well, I'm going to welcome up one of our senior pastors, Julia Pickerel, for this week's message. If you would like to follow along in her sermon notes, you can uh, go to our vineyardcolumbus.org slash this week page. Help me welcome up Pastor Julia. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Fantastic. Uh, we are at all of our campuses today. We're one church in multiple locations. So can we say good morning to East Campus? You guys are here. I'm gonna be hanging out with East Campus next week, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, good morning to Sawmill. Hey, who pulled the fire alarm campus? It's an insider joke. If you weren't there, you won't get it. Uh, Grandview, Lavinia, of course, our online folks and everybody here at Westerville. Good morning. Um, it is good to worship the Lord together. Can I just say, there's a lot of things kids could be doing, but man, going to summer camp looks like a really good one of them, doesn't it? I know some of you are wondering, why can't church be like that? Um, we are, congratulations church, finishing up what some of you feel like has been a 77 week series on the book of James. <laughs> We're hitting the last seven verses of the book of James. This has been so thrilling that we decided that our next book series is going to be the book of Jude. We're gonna take 25 weeks to move through the book of Jude. Those of you who are laughing, you're Bible people, because you know Jude only has one chapter, but it's got 25 verses. No, I'm just kidding. 
uh, we're actually, for our next uh, book series, going to be moving through the book of Colossians. That'll be later this winter. It's a good thing to move slowly through Scripture in context to get the whole thing. So I hope that you've enjoyed uh, this series. What we are going to be doing next after we wrap James up, and actually what James is going to do so nicely, almost as though it was planned providentially, James is going to move us in the last seven verses into these next 21 days. We're going to be doing a short series. We're going to take 21 days to set the table for Alpha. We've been talking a lot about Alpha. Right now, the vibe in the room is enough already, Alpha. I don't want to hear any more about Alpha. But we're going to do 21 days to set the table for Alpha. And here's what we're going to do over the next three weeks is we're going to do the thing that James keeps telling us to do, which is what is it that James keeps telling us to do? He keeps telling us to do something. Don't just believe something, don't just think something, but put your faith into action. So we together as the whole church are going to move into action over the next three weeks. We're going to move into the action of actually praying for people that we know who are far from God. And then, this is exciting. We're going to talk about actually inviting people that we know who are far from God to hang out with us at an Alpha. And then, are you so excited to hear what's next? Yes, you are. Yes, I know you are, really. You're going to take another step to take a risk to share a little bit about why it is you have hope in this world with someone else. And you're gonna let them listen to the story, and then you're gonna wait in dependency on the Holy Spirit, all of the goodness of God that you have in your life. Over the next three weeks, we are going to uh, figure out together how do we move forward in beginning to give that away. That is what James has been pressing us towards. Put your faith into action. And so before we move into these uh, last seven verses of the book of James, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about Alpha. So let me describe again, what is Alpha? It is simply this. It's an international organization of people who believe there is a better way to share the hope that they have in Christ. Do you, anybody here, think that there's a better way to talk across our divides than what we see in the world right now? Does anybody here look at the world right now and look at a lot of religion right now and think there's got to be a better way to demonstrate the goodness and mercy and justice and compassion and saving grace of God than what I regularly see on Twitter? There's a better way. And so there's a group of folks who decided there's a better way to create a space for people who are asking the most important questions in this world. Like, is there a God? Like, for real? Does prayer actually do anything? Am I all alone in this world? Is there any framework that's real by which I can figure out how to do my life, make decisions, figure out who I am, could forgiveness be a thing, even for the thing that I've done that I've not told anyone else about? People are asking these kinds of questions. And there were a group of folks in London who realized that folks who are asking these kinds of questions are not anymore going to church to get the answers. So they decided we have to create a different kind of space. And they also realized this, a lot of Christians in the church are asking these kinds of questions. Is God really real? Is forgiveness a thing? What is the person of the Holy Spirit and can I depend on him? And this group of folks in London realized that secular people weren't coming into the church and, and the church wasn't going out into the world. And so they had a couple of options. And those are the same options, my friends, that you and I have today. The first option is this, is that you completely disengage and disconnect from the culture, right? You build a wall. You move everybody apart and you say, it's gonna be my way and I'm just gonna ignore everybody over here. But then the words of this little light of mine ring in your ears, wait a minute. I'm supposed to let it shine. 
So we realize that first option of completely disengaging from culture doesn't work. And so we think, aha, I know another option. I'll engage with culture antagonistically because we all like a little bit of a fight these days, right? So we think I'll engage with culture and we'll tell people what they're doing wrong and we'll point fingers and we'll send out messages of judgment. And then we remember all the story about who is it that's supposed to throw the stone first? Ah, he or she who has not sinned, I guess that's not a good option. So there's another option. We completely disengage and disconnect from faith. And a lot of folks around here are doing that. Some of you at Sawmill Campus, you know so many people, so many of your friends are disengaging with faith because they have big questions. They have big wonderings, and they can't get good, robust, profound, mature answers. And so they disengage with faith. Some of your kids are doing this. It's deconstruction. And one of the challenges with deconstruction is that it's never meant to be an end unto itself. Anybody here who blows things up for a living knows that. Blowing something up typically leaves you with simply a different kind of mess than you had before. So disengaging from faith isn't an option or a good option. So what's the last option? The last option is that we engage robustly, intellectually, theologically, biblically, smartly, and independently. We engage with our faith. And then what we do is we engage with the world around us like Jesus did. As James tells us, God is compassionate and merciful. And what Alpha does is it creates a context, church, where you get to engage your own faith and engage culture. You gather together around a meal. If you can't make a meal, you have hors d'oeuvres. If you don't know what hors d'oeuvres are, pop some microwave popcorn and pour some water. It doesn't really matter. We gather together around a meal. We present a proposition about Jesus, about the Christian way of life. And then we practice dependency on the Holy Spirit as we have the big conversations in the world We listen to people, and we respect their points of view, and we pray the prayer that Vineyard people know so well, come Holy Spirit. We're gonna do this, church, every week for nine weeks. It's a tremendous commitment, I know. Nine weeks is very overwhelming. We're gonna do it every week in our small groups for nine weeks, gather around a meal, have a conversation about Jesus with people who may not know him. Our student groups are doing this at student night every week for nine weeks. We're doing Alpha Us, which is a particular version of Alpha for couples every week for nine weeks. We are doing uh, Alpha in our community center every week for nine weeks, and you guessed it, all across our city. In spaces like co-working spaces and combustion brewery, we are going to do alpha for folks who will not come into the church every week for nine weeks. Let me tell you, because I know you want to know before we move into James. Julia, why do you care so much? We've all got busy lives. Why are you asking me to do one more thing? Well, here's why. Because every night in our city and in our world, every night, folks you know East Campus, every night people wake up at 2 a.m. And they have the 2 a.m. questions. Any of you have 2 a.m. questions? Am I ever gonna be able to pay off this debt? What if this brain fog isn't brain fog? What if it's Alzheimer's? I'm all alone. Last week I had somebody say to me after going through a personal catastrophic crisis, is God punishing me. It's all I can think at 2 a.m. Is God punishing me? And most of our world, church, gets no good answer to those questions. They get no good framework for understanding what it means to be loved and accepted and forgiven. They have very little understanding of what could it mean that there is a way and the way is good and the way is true and the way leads to life. 
Most of our world has no good answer to those questions. So the reason that we are doing Alpha is because we're called by the Bible and by our God to give some answers. We don't have all of them, but we have enough. If you know Jesus, you have enough. That's what we're going to be doing over these next nine weeks. I know you have a lot to do, but if you are a leader here and you have not yet gone to an Alpha training, today, after service at East and Westerville and Grandview, we're doing our last leader training in person, Tuesday night online, our last Alpha training. If you are like me, you are a systematic non-joiner. I hate joining things just for the sake of not being a joiner. Would you join? We believe that the Lord has compassion and mercy for our city, and we want to be a church that is able to move that forward because God is good. And as James leaves us in his bit of writing, we see that not only God is good, but God pursues lost things because he loves them. So let's move into James together, but would you, wherever you are, across all of our campuses or at home, uh, let's pray together. God, would you increase your presence with us today? And would you orient us each to who we are Would you remind us why it is that we can have hope and peace and purpose in this world? And Lord, we repent of all the ways that we think it's just because we're actually kind of smart ourselves. Would you remind us that we're dependent on you? God, we pray for all that's to come with Alpha, Lord. We pray for those who are far. And I pray, church, that you would experience right now the proximity of Christ, that these words of James would breathe life into you. In Jesus' name, amen. James chapter five, here we go, 13 to 20. It's the last little bit. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer that's offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. All right, so we're going to take this from the top to the bottom. We're going to do a little bit of kindergarten Greek. Why? Because when we read the Bible, we have to understand what it means in context, right? Do you remember the Bible is a collection of writing, it's somewhat complex, and we're not meant to simply pick out our favorite verse, throw it at a wall, and say, that's what I'm into, in the same way that you would not read the Constitution in that way. We read the part in light of the whole, and we read it robustly. We think hard about it. So we're going to do a little bit of thinking together this morning. First, let's start with the sick business. James is talking about people who are in trouble, anyone identify? And people who are happy, I hope many identify. And then he starts talking about sick people. He kind of zags into this conversation. Is anyone among you sick? 
So the first thing I want us to pay attention to is that the Greek word for sick that James uses can equally be translated as frail or weak, spiritually languishing. When you see this Greek word in the Gospels, it's typically translated sick, as in physical illness. But when you see this word used by Paul in most of his letters, it's translated uh, more as weak, meaning spiritually weak, spiritually languishing, spiritually sick. Here's why this is important. It tells us that there's two equally valid ways of understanding the text that we just read. The first way that we can understand what James is talking about when he talks about people who are sick is that he's talking about people who are physically sick and then being physically restored. Now we know because we're New Testament Christians that we do believe that God physically restores physical sickness. That's one valid way to read the text. But a second equally valid way of reading the text is that James is talking about those who are spiritually sick. Those who are spiritually languishing, whose souls are weak, and that he's talking about what it means to restore the soul of someone who is spiritually languishing. Let me tell you why I think this is a valid way to read the text. Now, regardless of what you think about the Greek, the instruction is the same. We are called to pray. That's your only outline point today, you guys. It's like super, there's not even an outline. No applications, no funny stories. We're gonna walk out of here and be like, God help me pray. Here's why this is valid. First of all, it's context. Do you guys remember who James was written to? What was the bigger picture context? He's writing to the first church in Jerusalem, a small, beleaguered, worn out church in a tremendous amount of political and cultural upheaval, a church that was being torn apart at the seams, tempted unto violence, there was a coup going on, there was pandemic, does it sound familiar? James is writing his entire letter as a way of encouraging a community that was spiritually languishing to become mature. So the whole context of this book has to do with spiritual weakness and spiritual maturity. Second reason that I think it's a valid reading of the text, guess what, it's context. Not just the whole book of James is about this, but just the verses prior to what we've read, let's reconsider what James was actually telling the church. Just a few moments ago, he calls them to be patient in suffering, which means what? They were suffering. He calls them to endure hardship, which means what? They were experiencing hardship. He calls them to trust that God is compassionate and merciful even when it doesn't feel like it, which means what? It didn't feel like it. So just in the few verses before we dropped in today, James is speaking into a context of spiritually languishing folks. Third reason it's a valid reading of the text is guess what? Context. Verse 15, the word for sick can be translated as weary. Strong's Concordant translates it spent. Has anybody ever felt spiritually spent? Spiritually weary? And then Strong's tells us then a few lines later, when James says that he will raise you up, that can equally be translated as someone who is being restored from a dead or a damaged state, someone who is being restored. So let's think about the text through this lens together. The prayer offered in faith, James tells us, will make the sick the spent, the weary to the point of sickness, the soul weary person, well, the Lord will raise them up. He will restore them from their place of sickness. And then the last reason that I think this is a really good way to read the text is context. Because where we go right after this with James is this. My brothers and sisters, if 
any one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. What James is talking about here isn't physical sickness and physical restoration. He's talking about soul sickness, wandering sickness, a lost sickness, and a spiritual restoration. So there's something happening in the book of James after he has spent so much time telling us to put our faith into action, that he addresses what happens, what happens when we begin to lose our capacity, what happens when we're looking out at a world where people are spiritually lost and languishing. Then James moves into this business about the oil. What does he mean about the oil? If any one of you is sick, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now again, this is in verse 14. The anointing with oil here uses the Greek form of the word anoint. That doesn't mean a sacred anointing, nor does it imply the anointing of a body before death. It implies a, a, a healing anointing. It's the same picture that we have of the woman who poured out perfume on the feet of Jesus. Do you remember that story? She anoints his feet with oil. It's an honoring word. It's like bringing somebody into your space and treating them like a king. And in the Middle East, oil was used medicinally. It was used honoring. Imagine living in the desert. You have no airco, friends. You have no shower, friends. Your skin is dry, your feet are dirty, and you come into a house and they pour oil over you. It's healing, it's cleansing, it's honoring. That's the picture that James is giving us. So can you hear what James is telling us? Is anyone among you, we're gonna read it again, in trouble? Is anyone at home in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you weary to the point of sickness? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with this healing and cleansing oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick, the spent, the soul-weary person well, and the Lord will raise them up. He will restore them from that damaged state. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be made whole. This is the message of James. Now, there are some of us today who are wondering, could I ever be forgiven? There are some of us that show up at church and we smile and we sing and there is something in our life, there's something in our past, there's something that we've done, there's a wandering that we've made and it seems so far. And the question in mind right now, wherever you are listening is, can I be forgiven? Is forgiveness real? Could it be that this weight that I carry, this darkness that lives in the pit of my stomach, could it be that I could ever be restored? The worst of the worst, can it be restored? What is it that James says? And the prayer offered in faith will make the spent, the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up from their damaged state. If they have sinned, good news, he says, they will be forgiven, which is why you can confess your sins to each other without feeling a tremendous amount of shame and humiliation, because you can be healed, you can be made whole. And if there is anyone right now listening to me who feels like I need to be made whole, if you are experiencing in your heart a sense of, yes, please let this be true, I don't know if it is, 
but if God is real and if God would forgive me through Jesus Christ, I want that. If that's you, right now, in the middle of this preach, wherever you are, you can grab your phone, you can text the word believe to 98977, silly little text message. We'll allow one of our pastoral staff or leaders to reach out to you and to ask you, what is it that you are longing to say yes to? Can we talk a little bit more about what it means to be forgiven and raised up? That is the good news of Jesus Christ. So James talks to us about this. And then he moves into this ancient story about Elijah. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. He's just told us to pray. That prayer, he said, is powerful and effective. Elijah, this Old Testament prophet, was a human being even as we are. Now, Elijah was like the superhero prophet. He was like the LeBron James of prophets. But James makes a point to say he was just some dude like you are. And when he prayed... It didn't rain for like three and a half years. And then when he prayed again, it did rain. Now, is James talking to us right now about the weather? I don't think so. I think what James is doing is after he compels us to pray for those who are wandering, those who are lost, those who are weary, he's reminding us what happens when we pray, Christians. Some of us are like, I don't know. (laughs) I don't usually feel like much. James knows that, and so he tells a story, and he says, when you reorient yourself to the God of the universe, who made all, is all, is all in all, when you reorient yourself to him, and you tell him what you need, what you long for, when you intercede for someone to him, There is a mystery that happens that none of us can understand, and that is this. It's the power that can change the natural order of things, like you saw in Elijah in the Old Testament. That same power can interrupt the natural order of things in this world. Christians, do you ever look out in the world and think the natural order needs to be interrupted? And then you're like, I'm just going to compose a fantastic Facebook post. I'm going to change the world. No. Nothing will work but the intervention of the power of God, and that's what James is telling us through Elijah. He's a person just like you, and when he prayed, real things really happened. James is reminding us of the remarkable power of prayer. And this language about Elisha prayed and the earth produced its harvest. It should remind us of some words of Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus talked about a harvest? What did he say about it? He said, the harvest is plentiful. Oh my gosh, there's like, he said, there's like so much to harvest. But the workers are few. So the picture that we're left with is this. It's that James is writing to a weary, worn-out church, and he's just kind of given them a big psych-up message about putting their faith into action, and then he speaks tenderly to them. You're happy, you're in trouble, you're sick, you are worn out to the point of death, and you see people wandering from the truth. What is it that you're supposed to do? You're meant to pray for them. You're meant to pray as though your prayer will influence the God of the universe in a mysterious way that we don't understand. You're meant to prepare a table for them, welcome them in as though you're pouring out oil and perfume on a weary soul. That's how God treats lost things. What does the good shepherd do? He pursues lost things. So, again, long sermon, you guys. Lots of random Greek, no funny stories. I don't even think I gave you an outline to fill in. So here's the two things that I want to leave you with, that James leaves us with. If you are a Christian, you are called to pray, not aspirationally pray, 
not sort of pray, but like sit down, get a journal, and pray. You are called to turn your heart to the people around you who are spiritually weak and languishing and lost, and you are called to pray, and then you are called to pursue, to go after. You have good news, church. And it doesn't matter if the whole world doesn't understand it right now, and it doesn't matter if sometimes we look out and we see religious people and we think, oh my gosh, they're doing more harm than good. What does that mean? It means that we do more good than harm. We pursue. We're going to gather together on Wednesday the 7th for an Alpha prayer night across our campuses. We're going to gather together in person. We're going to pray our hearts out. I hope you come I know you have so many things to do. I've got like a gazillion things to do. You got sports, you got, I got tumbling. I, I don't have tumbling, my daughter has tumbling. I drive her to tumbling. Be awesome if I threw a back handspring right now, wouldn't it? Woohoo! Um, I, know, I know we've got a lot going on. But could we come together and pray? We need to come together and pray. The seventh Alpha Prayer Night. One of my favorite phrases, you guys I know I like phrases in the Bible even more than I like whole sentences, but one of my favorite phrases in the Bible is out of Luke, the story of the prodigal son, but while he was still a long way off. I love that phrase. Really good father, really gracious father, really rich father, really free father, really merciful father, really compassionate father, really kinda idiot son, (laughs) really kinda stupid son, really kinda I gotta learn it the hard way myself son. Goes off, wastes a lot, spends a lot, loses a lot, destroys a lot. And while he was still a long way off, That is how God sees lost things. He sees them from a long way off. And how does he treat lost things? How did he treat the lost son, the lost sheep, the lost coin? He seeks after them. He pursues them. He doesn't point fingers at them. He doesn't rally against them. He has compassion on them like sheep without a shepherd. Oh my gosh, these folks. Have you ever been lost? Have you ever lost something important? Anybody ever lost a wedding ring? An accident? (laughs) A phone? You guys, there's some Welsh guy who in 2013 threw away the wrong hard drive and he threw away the key to what would now be, depending on the market, between 200 and 500 million Bitcoin. It's in a landfill. He's trying to get the local government to let him excavate the landfill. He lost something important. I once lost my daughter. (laughs) The shores of the North Sea. We did baptisms in the North Sea. Crowded beach, ice cold water. She was nowhere to be found. I felt like I was going to die. Pastor Brooke, a dear friend of mine and I, running up and down, screaming her name. Where is she, where is she? Brooke brings her back to me. I threw my arms around her, I kissed her. Here's the thing, she didn't know she was lost. (laughs) Let me say it again, here's the thing. She didn't know she was lost, but she would have eventually. The good shepherd pursues lost sheep. This is how James leaves us. Anyone who goes after one of these lost wanderers, anyone who goes after one of these lost wanderers and and, and he saves them, he saves them. And, And he brings them back to what is the good way, the real truth, the life, the way that brings us straight to the face of our Father who is full of compassion, mercy, anyone who prays and pursues people like that. Oh, those are my people, James tells us, and that is who we are called to be, church. And that is why next week we're moving into 21 days of actually putting our faith into actual action. Amen?
campus pastors. I'm gonna release uh, your campuses to you. God bless you guys, have a great ministry time. And uh, for those of you who are online, I would love for you to kind of dial in again and, and for folks here in the room, if you're able to, would you stand? We're gonna pray together. You know the lines of that song, beautiful you are. And sometimes, church, um, sometimes we forget how good a God we serve. And sometimes we forget what it feels like to be lost. Because you can look fantastic. You can look like you've got everything solid. And you can wake up at 2 a.m. and think to yourself, oh my God, I have no idea how I'm gonna make it through tomorrow. And the goodness of God is that he seeks after us, he loves us, he designed us to flourish. So could you just for a moment, if you want to, you can open your hands. I put my hand on my heart. You can close your eyes if you want to, but would you join me if you're at home, kind of dial in and let's just pray together. Spirit, would you help us feel your presence, Lord? We know you're here, but would you come nearer? Just come, come Holy Spirit. I'm just going to take a moment in quiet and we're going to pray for each other. But just, Spirit of God, would you increase your presence? If there's some of you uh, listening right now, you have such big questions. You really don't know if God is real. You really, you really don't know. I want to pray especially for you now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you pursue? Would you reveal yourself to folks who are weary, whose souls are tired? God, we give you our small, tiny, little bitty gift of faith. And we ask that you would set it on fire with your spirit. So would you increase your presence, Spirit of God, now in the name of Jesus, would you come? Let's come, Jesus. to take time now and invite a couple of folks uh, forward, or if you're online, you can text 989-77 to pray, but um, if there are those of you who find your minds like stuck in sort of loops, and the loops are like um, everybody else gets to be forgiven except for me, or grace is real except for what I did, or God is love except for that he doesn't like me, or God isn't real except for that he's punishing me and he's cruel. If, if you have looping thoughts in your head about who God is, this is kind of particular, you'll know who you are. It, you're just stuck in this pattern. I, I would love for us to pray for you um, because I feel like the Lord, he is jealous for his reputation and he is really good. And if you are stuck in a space where you are unable to believe that or your brain just keeps triggering other thoughts, I would love for us to pray for you, the goodness of God over you. So that's one group of folks that I want us to pray for. Just come Holy Spirit, just increase. Just give, give, give yourself a second. We're just gonna wait on the Lord here for another minute. Just come Lord. Show yourself to us, Jesus. Some of you, uh, this will be the second group I wanna pray for. Some of you are walking in a season of grief and it's not uh, just acute grief, but it's chronic grief, particularly for some of you uh, it's in relation to your kids or to your grandchildren. You have a deep sense of like a chronic kind of grief. This, this didn't go the way I thought it would go. I'm not in control. I, I, 
I am seeing some people wander. I'm seeing some people who feel lost and I am grieving that. I wanna pray for you that the Lord would accompany you in that space. So for those two things, or of course for any other reason, I'm gonna invite you right now to come forward. Can our prayer ministry team come forward? Um, and we're gonna pray for those two things, folks who are experiencing grief, folks who feel like their thoughts are in a loop. And if you happened in the middle of this preach to pray with me when I, when I shared a little bit about this forgiveness of sins, if you felt anything like a yes in your heart, would you also come forward and let us pray for you? If you're online, we'd love to pray for you that way as well. We're gonna close um, our time with uh, one song of worship and then communion. God bless you. As we come to the communion table today, we're gonna stay in line with Julia's message and we're gonna read a prayer 
from the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi. Let's read. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Amen. You know, when we think about this prayer, uh, as we come to the communion table, we come and we think of the gift of righteousness. This righteousness cannot be gained by our own efforts. It's the fruit of what Jesus has already done on the cross. So let us remember that. And as we take the elements today, let us think of those who have yet to receive this gift as their own. On the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. Let's take the bread together. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I want to just give you, underline a couple of things that Pastor Julia said with a few details, and then I'm gonna pray a prayer benediction to close us today. The first is that prayer night that she mentioned. I wanna invite you to come out to our prayer night. We've got one at every single campus, Westerville included, on September 7th. So that's not this, next, this Wednesday, but the Wednesday after. It'll be here at Westerville, 7 p.m. Come on out and join us. Let's communally intercede for what God could do at Alpha. The second thing is these invitation cards. You may have gotten one or you'll see them on your way in and out. I, these are not for you. These I've been handing out, it was just at Otterbein on Friday, handing these out, they've got a QR code that, that sends you to a website that's Ask at Alpha. It's a really simple way for you to just get somebody to wonder about coming to an Alpha. I'd invite you to take one, maybe stick it in your car, put it on your fridge, and over the next th three weeks, use this as a visual cue to be praying for people by name and praying for yourself to get courage to invite someone into one of these really unique spaces called Alpha. And the third thing is that if you are like Julia, you're not a joiner, maybe you're one of our small group leaders and you've like plugged your ears, like our small group's not doing alpha, but you're like at least open to considering turn, transforming your small group into alpha for a few weeks. There's your last chance to get trained is today here at Westerville, right after our 11 o'clock service. It's gonna be right through those doors. So head on out come for lunch, come on back for training today for our Alpha. We also have an online training on Tuesday, but don't wait till Tuesday, you'll, you'll talk yourself out of it. Just come back, get trained today. We need lots of people uh, that are trained up and willing to set the table for Alpha. And I'm gonna throw one more in there. If you are a student or you're a parent of a high schooler or middle schooler, we had to cancel student night last week So here at Westerville, so we're doing a rain check. We're having student night tonight. So come on out at 6 p.m. if you're a high schooler or a middle schooler. All right, let's pray together. I bless you in the name of Jesus with whatever weariness you have, whatever wandering you're noticing in yourself, whatever tiredness, spiritual sickness that you're noticing, I bless you, I pray the closeness of Christ, that you would experience his embrace of you today. And I bless you with the gift of the burden to pray for people. Pray that you and I would leave here willing to get on our hands and knees and cry out to the Lord together, amen. Amen. God bless you.